Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome back to the show fellow Scarlet Imprint author, Peter Mark Adams. Peter wrote one of my very favorite books from 2017, The Game of Saturn. He joins us today to talk about his latest title, Mystai, Dancing Out the Mysteries of Dionysus. Peter, welcome back. Gordon, lovely to be back. Two yes. years since the last Two time, right? Two very, very brisk years. Exactly. Yes, well, indeed. We were just talking before I hit the record button. Uh, I've seen a book and you haven't. That's right. Well. <laughs> Except for photographs, and it, but it looks gorgeous. I yes. Think, uh, Alcestis yes. has to be commended for the design. She terrifies me. Artwork. Yeah, she terrifies me every time, every, every time, I think. <laughs> well, I tell you, you, you can't imagine the trouble we had to bring this imagery together. Even though the frescoes were renewed, uh, I think, 2015, with uh, the l- removal of a fine layer using lasers, so that they're now back to their you know, original color and detail. Nevertheless, the... The difficulty of getting decent uh, imagery, you can't imagine. I mean, waiting nine, ten months and then some murky photographs show up. (laughs) It's been an incredibly difficult job just to uh, get the quality of reproduction that we needed. Did you end up? Did you end up like sending someone over there? I mean, how, what, what do you do when you wait when you get photos that are like, well, we can't use these? I mean, do you, well, you both, ring up and yell uh, in Italian? Well, it's you just don't get a response, basically, right? Um, you know, and I've sent uh, I've sent several emails that were never answered, and uh, Scarlet's have visited the site as as did I, and the lighting inside it now is 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 quite poor because of course they want to preserve it. Mm. And um, you're not actually allowed into the room itself. It's kind of, you know, it's very difficult. I- images taken by yourself uh, don't have the right angles and quality and parts of the room are obscured. And we, we finally, I think, had to get commercial imagery. So, you know, a hu- huge problem in putting together the uh, imagery. So when you look at the book, you, you probably don't have that feeling. No. All, all of that months of work that she has put in to find and arrange the available imagery to give you that sense um, is, is all kind of hidden under the surface. So Absolutely. huge commendation for Alkis. Well, yeah, one of my observations was going to be that uh, with a book like this, and we'll, we'll probably give people a little bit of a, a detail about what exactly we're talking about in a second, but you actually have to demonstrate a sense of place at, at quite a high level of detail for, for the sort Absolutely. of thesis to hang together. And it does. Like the, the images in the book leave you, you don't get lost for a second in, in the kind of uh, exploration or exegesis of, of, of your ideas. So, yeah, she terrifies me. I think it's the most, I, I think, as, a, as an artist and, and, and bookmaker, it's just astonishing work. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So what are we talking about, Peter? What is, um, how did you land on this idea um, for a book? And, and, and what is Mistai about? The, I actually pitched this idea to Peter Gray on the day before the launch of Game of Saturn. You know, I was absolutely sure it was the project I wanted to do. And it's a project that I've been tracking for decades, actually. And I've never been satisfied with anything I ever read about these frescoes. They, they were always saying more to me than any of the accounts um, that I could get hold of suggested. So 
it comes back to the old adage, you know, the, the book you're looking for is the one you probably need to sit down and read, <laughs> write yourself. <laughs> and and, and that's, that set me off on it. Right. And um, I mean, well, well, let's start with, um, so that's kind of the why. I mean, you've always been interested in, in history and so on. But um, it's an intersection, Gordon. It's an intersection of uh, like folklore, myth, mythology, um, the mysteries as a topic, ethnography. They, they all come together. Art history, they all come together with these frescoes. And, and, and truly, you need a kind of transdisciplinary approach in order to be able to capture what they're going on about. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, uh, what, I, what I've seen up to now has always been very much in an academic silo um, so that you get a very partial view or, or a very speculative view. You know, there's still people who talk about them being a, a wedding ceremony. For instance. Well, let's, I'm going to jump in there. So, Peter, what is the Villa of the Mysteries? And, and what's going on in room four and five in the sort of like general academic guess and, and maybe why that should be wrong? But what's the Villa of the Mysteries? The Villa itself is an enormous um, elite Roman villa on the edge of Pompeii, 3,700 square meter villa with 60 rooms. Um, it came into existence in the first century BCE when the Romans colonized um, Campania, essentially, and started to um, buy up huge estates there. And the, the, the local culture, of course, had been very much influenced by uh, Greece. The Greek colonies had existed uh, around the coasts of Italy since the 8th century BCE at least. And one of the oldest is, is Cume, just along the coast from Naples, not far from Pompeii. So the merger of Roman colonial culture and the kind of indigenous um, Greek cultures occurred in that particular area in a very intense way. So the, the Romans, um, I think, as part of their colonial endeavor, sought to integrate themselves with that culture. And on the other hand, they were profoundly influenced by it. it simply was a, a superior artistic and, you may say, spiritual achievement. And it's there, I think, that we find Orphism um, writ large. And, and writ in such a way that it would go on to influence uh, not just Roman culture, but Neoplatonic thinking, and from Neoplatonic thinking, the Renaissance. So I think it's kind of ground zero of that whole tradition. Yeah. And so the house would have been in occupation for 150 years um, before Roughly. the volcano erupted? Yeah, the volcano was around about 79 CE. Yeah. So at least 100 years. So that's probably several generations of the one family? I would guess so. And uh, we would have to say one of the elite families possibly related to uh, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, a well-known um, aristocrat who had actually conquered the region at the end of the social wars and installed his own relatives um, as governors. So quite possibly is connected to, the, to his line. Well, there's a floor plan in the book, and, and it, is, it is bigger than my house, let me just say. So <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely an impressive family. Yes, yes, this uh, real elite family. And um, so we call it the Villa of the Mysteries. It obviously wasn't called that um, during the day, right? So during the time that it was actually occupied. So in this yeah. giant, uh, beautiful, enormous house on the edge of Pompeii, looking at the Bay of Naples, um, how did it? How? Why do we call it the Villa of the Mysteries? What's inside it that is of interest? Okay, to you? At, the villa? at the very, uh, the house itself can be divided up into several large suites. And um, the Roman fashion was to have the, the front of the house a kind of semi-public region where the clientes, everyone who depended upon this family, would come each morning to pay their respects and ask for favors and so on. And uh, at the very back of the house, at the, the rooms at the very back of the most rear suite of rooms 
are occupied by this incredible fresco sequence. There's two rooms, traditionally called room four and five, and they are at the most remote and difficult to access portion of the villa. Um, they've been joined together by what looks to me like a, a small doorway, because it, it's not in proportion with all the other doorways in the house. And uh, the two rooms share a Dionysian themed imagery. It's the most intense and concentrated collection of Dionysian images, I think, in the entire history of uh, Greco Roman art. Um, the images are not those usually associated with a kind of symposium and banqueting tradition, which would typically show all the Silenoi, satyrs, and nymphs, and the paraphernalia of, of drinking and, and eating. These images are all related in some way to um, the, the conduct of an initiatory ritual. So that in the small adjoining room four, we find images such as a priestess, a corobantic dancer, and then passing through into the main room the images suddenly take on a life-size proportion so that they entirely dominate the entire circumference of the room. And this is extraordinary because we're looking at kind of proto-Renaissance figures going about ritual activity. And I, I can't think of a single other instance of this in the entire history of art, actually. Yeah, it's um, just so we can situate it for people who are listening. Um, the smaller room is, and you're right, like it, there, it's a funny angle. So getting from room four to room five, you kind of go through like a, a corner, which, which does rather suggest they're trying to maximize the available wall space. But as you walk through that door and what is effectively the far end is, is a, or was partly damaged now, but like a, a giant um, Dionysus and Ariadne um, wedding scene dominating the, the very back of it and that's led to the general academic guess that this room has something to do with the wedding right mm -hmm. that's right and yet independent research on roman social customs cannot adduce a single instance of such a wedding ritual Oh, it's pretty crazy, even for the Romans. Like, you don't get that many yeah. black goats staring at you when you go to a wedding and, and like, <laughs> winged people whipping women coming down. Off the <laughs> like, you know, the Romans were pretty out there, but this is, not, this is not how even they did weddings. No. And, in fact, they had a very kind of informal approach to weddings. The bride would simply, uh, upon engagement, wear an iron ring, and then upon the wedding, simply go to her husband's house. You know, there just isn't the elaboration that we see evidenced on these walls in any connection whatsoever with the, any known social ritual. This is a ritual of quite different order. Why do we get things like this wrong? Why, you know what I mean? Not the, I mean, not you and I, Peter. I mean, culturally, why have we just walked into this room or this, these two rooms, this sort of sequence, and gone, wow, this is really nice guess it has something to do with the wedding moving on yeah i i, I mean <laughs> my instinctive response is that there's simply lack of interest in 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 ritual and the other world but there must be a deeper reason for it and i can only think that it's the lack of um cross-pollination between for instance ethnographic studies of rituals and roman art history or you know, archaeology and art history. There's the lack of uh, feedback between these disciplines so that everyone seems to approach the frescoes from within their own silo, their own academic silo, you know, whether it's classics, archaeology, art history, or, or whatever. And, and, that, and that's what I've seen uh, in attempting to decode the sequence of images that all the available texts take a very isolated view of what they're looking at. And they cannot create a coherent narrative that accommodates all of the rich detail that's actually there. 
I think it's also, I was thinking about this as I, I read through, and it, in many, in some ways, it reminded me of my own process um, when I wrote Starships, right? Where it is, it's silos, but inside each of those silos, there's the sort of, uh, they're range bound by public acceptability. So there are things that even within those silos, you can and can't say. And as I was reading through your book in particular, and I noticed this with uh, Game of Saturn as well, something mm-hmm. Terence McKenna said. Uh, about the world needing more radical art historians. Now, Terence said a lot of stuff, and he, in fact, did study art history, so he would, like, think that that's something the world needed. But yeah, he has a point, and his point is this, which I think you explore in your books, and it's it's definitely evident in, in Misti, is... Uh, it's not just interdisciplinary, but it's it's interdisciplinary from a uh, a, a sort of jailbroken worldview that doesn't need to be range bound by by that public acceptability. I think that's what Terence was getting at when you sort of do um, cross cultural or ethnographic understandings of art and ritual. You were dealing mm-hmm. with the sacred, and you need to be able to say you're dealing with the sacred. Yes. I think the only person who's done this was uh, Merci Aliade. And um, I think he was one of the first to point out the existence of, of rites of higher initiation. But I've never seen anyone follow up on that. You know, he made this insight, what, in 1960s or something. And yet, such is the way academia structures itself as an industry. There are very sharp lines of delimitation on what can be said without, for instance, inviting ridicule or, or criticism. Mm. And I, I think just the career structure of academia means that it, it, it's, it's more conservative than, you know, the evidence warrants. It, it's, it's easier to ignore the evidence than to cross the boundaries of the sayable. Yeah, and, and you know, I've seen this again in certain of the anthropological papers that have dealt with uh, first-hand accounts of participating in or observing magical rituals, in which there's been incredible effects described, but then it's in an academic paper, and then they're wholly ignored by the academic community. It's like you know, that's the third rail; you don't stand on that. And I think that this has held back uh, scholarship on works. The, the solar busker is a good example. You know, the silence around my study of that deck is, is deafening. And, and I, I'm sure my study of the Villa of the Mysteries will elicit the same response <laughs> from the <laughs> academic community. You know, it's, it's just easier to ignore it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's my rant for the no, day. No, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely <laughs> get it. But I think, because uh, I want to, we want to sort of dive into some of the motifs that you explore in the book. But before we do that, we sort of situated people in, in a building and two rooms. But let's widen it back out and talk about, because yeah. this is, uh, we're talking about the mysteries when we talk about the villa of the mysteries. So uh, yeah. we should probably situate that discussion. Like, what are they and, and how long did they go for? What are the mysteries? Okay. Um, that's a really difficult question to answer because ethnographically we see mystery-like traditions in most cultures. And what they seem to have been designed to do is go one step further than the old rites of passage. So that if you can contrast these two cultural forms, the um, the rites of passage are designed to move or transfer a person from one social role to another. They enact that movement. But the mysteries, the rites of initiation, the rites of higher initiation are selective. They're not compulsory. They attract uh, very few people and they are designed or they engineer a, a confrontation between the individual and the numinous, however you wish to describe that. More specifically, they introduce the initiate directly to the deity whose mysteries they are. So typically, 
you would see in any population no more than like 10% or less of people um, going on to partake of the, the rites of higher initiation in any culture. Um, but because, quite frankly, the entire ambience of them is pretty scary. Um, we can we have several uh, good quotes from the past. Uh, for instance, Plutarch um, describes the act of dying as paralleling um, initiation into the mysteries. In other words, you know. S s Psychoenergetically, they were rites or rituals of such potency that they took the initiate to the brink of death before, so to speak, the enlightening or the, the vision of the deities occurred. And um, still another initiate describes how before the deities show themselves in the mysteries, all manner of demonic forces are unleashed. So however you cut the cloth, this was a pretty um, intense and disturbing experience to undergo. So you had to have a high degree of spiritual uh, motivation to undertake these rites. And do we think they were, you said about 10% of the population. Is this, uh, is this for a specific class? Is this like the business class of religion? No, but that's a strange thing. Although it, it required some expense to undertake the, the rituals, they were open to anyone. And, you know, you, you have like some of the old Greek comedies talking about people going around borrowing, you know, money from people to afford uh, a sacrificial animal to take to the mysteries of Eleusis. You know. the, the great mysteries on the island of Samothrace, of course, required a sea voyage, and you would have to um, stay somewhere for a couple of days. You know. But even, even on Samothrace, as I say, you know, no more than one in ten actually went the full distance. Most people who went to Samothrace only undertook the preliminary ritual, a purification ritual called myasis. Um, and that was enough for them. Tiny number descended the spiraling path down into the valley at night where the uh, mystery initiation itself took place. So as I say, I, I think for a lot of people, um, they didn't want to get that close to the disturbing apex of the spiritual encounter that the mysteries um, created. It was simply too intense an experience for them. Well, it's, it, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's face to face with a, a, an ultimate reality. I mean, that's actually what's on offer. You, you kind of, you come away from it in theory, particularly the, you know, the majority of, well, I don't know, that's the wrong thing to say. Some of them are, are explicitly entheogenic, and, and so you have, um, you, you come away with, with that sort of surety of some sort of continuation of life after death, according to, to some of the quotes, and that seems to be what's on offer, but it's an intense road to get there. Absolutely, yes, yes. And so uh, the rights of other uses from memory went for over a thousand years so they're they're actually centuries old before people on in this you know on the beautiful italian coast started building this large villa um so before yeah the, yeah, it, well, yeah, yeah the evidence is that they were conducted there for at least 500 years before they were um mirrored in in the rites at the villa yeah it was so a, that, that's the important bit I want because we I think a lot of people know about um, the Eleusinian mysteries and and so on as this this big and, and long running idea. But what's so fascinating, yeah. or what is endlessly fascinating about your study in this book is that yes, we're dealing with a highborn family and quite, it, but it's almost like the covenization of a of a mystery tradition because the rooms are smaller than you know grandiose temples on islands, uh, and they're in a domestic setting. But it's a highborn domestic setting, and we do know. Uh, and I'll get I'll turn this into a question in a minute, but we do have textual examples, not from this site, but elsewhere in that world, that kind of shows how class was treated in in like a, a Dionysian 
cult, right? So, I mean, talk us through that. What do we know about, say, gender and class breakdown uh, in, in like a Dionysian cult, uh, roughly contemporaneous to the Villa of the Mysteries? Okay. Um, I think just to frame that, uh, we need to go back to the mid-6th century BCE um, and with the social and political revolution that occurred in Athens. Um, these were essentially associated with the figure of uh, the tyrant uh, Pisistratus, not a name you'd want to try and say after a couple of drinks, um, who introduced a massive series of social reforms which included accommodating certain cults within state religion. Um, for instance, he, he took the rights of Eleusis and, and, and uh, connected them to the Athenian state system. And the other side of his work was to provide massive sponsorship to all the indigenous rites of Dionysus that were going on. So all of a sudden, you have this huge upwelling of um, grassroots Dion Dionysian artwork, um, festivals, ceremonies, and rituals. And it was in this context that we all of a sudden see uh, ceramics, for instance, in which it's exclusively women who are uh, conducting the rites. So since most diaspora communities are more like their home communities than the home communities are, these traditions very quickly spread to Campania, for instance. And we see very early on, uh, indeed in you know 6th to 5th century BCE, evidence of uh, women-only rituals of Dionysus taking place there. And, you know, by the first century BCE, jumping up to our own timeline um, for the villa, um, Diodorus Siculus talks about how at all of the festivals of Dionysus, the married women go aside to conduct their own Maenadic and mystery rites. So it, it was an established tradition of at least 500 years for women to be conducting their own um, Dionysian ritual processes, both festivals, ceremonies, and the mystery rites. And it's, it's that tradition that we see reflected and caught in the Villa of the Mysteries, because, of course, the elite had the wherewithal to create these fantastic frescoes. And, and somehow, by chance, they survived the um, eruption of Vesuvius in 79. So although it's an elite context that we're looking at, it's actually a tradition, a grassroots tradition of Dionysian mystery initiation that's reflected there. Yeah, and that, uh, that's a good match to the form itself. So where does, where does Dionysus, come from, Dionysus come from and uh, does he have a cult center? Because this is, this is the interesting sort of tension or uh, set of circumstances that I think informs, informs the uniqueness of his cult structures. Yeah. Um, the notion of a vegetation deity, of course, goes back to is lost in the mists of time. And we find uh, Dionysian-like figures throughout the Mediterranean. Um, you know, you can think of all of those gods going back to Tahunas on the Anatolian mainland, uh, Hadad in Syria. Peculiarly, these two deities are normally thought of, sto as, of as storm deities, but they had forms, Hadad of the vineyard or Tahunsas of the vineyard, which were explicitly their vegetable ac aspect. And then moving again forward from out of the Bronze Age, you, you, you start to find uh, this specialized aspect of the deity in, in, in gods such as Attis, Adonis, Tammuz, um, the Etruscan Fuflans, and the Roman Liber Pater. So, Dionysus exists, you know, from the Bronze Age in, in a context of ve vegetation deities um, who enjoy a, very much a grassroots following. They're not the uh, supreme warrior gods that are of interest to the elite. Um, they're much more connected to the 
uh, agricultural cycle and therefore to the peasantry and therefore have a far more grassroots following and tradition. And this seems to have continued for, for millennia so that in Campania in the first century BCE, we still find this tradition of grassroots Dionysian mystery initiation. And in fact, Plato was quite scathing of the tradition because it involved itinerant uh, initiators. So obviously that was a system that would be open for anyone to claim to be able to uh, perform. Mm. And from the 3rd to 2nd centuries BCE, we see the states increasingly getting involved in trying to get these people registered. So, you know, they're asked to show up, um, deposit a sealed copy of their liturgy, and demonstrate a lineage of at least three generations of Dionysian initiation. And of course, to pay the appropriate fees to the state. So, yeah, there, there was a concern very early on about how to make sure that the initiations that were on offer were valid. And the states, by and large, uh, set out to manage this process. Um, but it, it, it retained its essentially ethnic um, and itinerant character throughout. It never became established as like a, a temple cult. Uh, it never had its huge center of uh, like Eleusis or Samothrace. It was always a kind of wandering itinerant type of initiation process. And, and, that, and that's what we see exactly reflected in the frescoes themselves. Yeah, see, this, um, this interested me because... Uh, when we talk about it being wandering and itinerant, it sounds we can accidentally give off the impression that it was in some sense disorganized. But what I find interesting is so Plato, the, the jump between Plato and the Villa of the Mysteries is 400 years, give or take. Yeah. Uh, and so he's kind of complaining in that rich boy way that Plato and his people do um, about this kind of stuff. But if you look at the actual art that is on offer in rooms four yeah. and five, and this is what I learned from your book. Um, well, I'll, I'll, who painted it, Peter? Uh, and, <laughs> and, and what did they paint? Because this, I think this is the king hit. Yeah, I mean, we don't know who painted it. <laughs> That's a sim simple answer to that one. Um, it is, it's executed in a rather strange way. It's, it's almost as though the walls were prepared in this so-called second style of Roman uh, wall painting with these large, like three uh, layers, and the central center layer is these like large red panels that go around the room. But then, for the Villa of the Mysteries, the figures themselves were not part of that originally. They've been painted on top of it, and that's very strange. Um, and they've been painted on top of it in such a way that they would, as groups of people, overlap with each other and overlap with the kind of architectural background of the panelled. Um, uh, red panelled room. So clearly the artist set out to depict an almost cinematic sequence. The figures yeah. are all in movement or they're, you know, conducting a ritual and, and they like flow from one group to the next and then into a mythical space and back out of a mythical space. So the actual interpretation of this artwork is problematic because what is it that the artist is setting out to achieve? And because it has such a high quality of naturalistic representation, our first thought is that, okay, these must be real people going about these tasks. And yet that takes you in a completely false direction because at least half of the figures are taken straight out of a style book of Dionysian initiation um, figural representation. Yeah, see, that's, the bit, the, that's the bit that I, I think is the, is the king hit or the smoking gun, right? So the building, mm. the room is an odd shape. So you have the, the entry is kind of coming in through a corner. But for people mm. who haven't read the book yet, there's also like a, essentially a balcony uh, and another double door. So it's, it's painted to order because, as you say, it's quite clearly um, supposed to be uh, engaged with in a, in a film strip way. But mm -hmm. more than half of it comes straight out of a, a brand book for a Dionysian cult. Yeah. And, and, that, and, and by that, I mean, talk us through that, Peter. 
Well, there's a set of um, mosaics from Jamela in Algeria, um, from a house of or a room of Dionysus. And those mosaics, although they're separated from the villa frescoes by two to three hundred years, by being on a different continent and being in a different artistic medium, exactly mirror the imagery in the room of the Villa of the Mysteries. And that's extraordinary. By what mechanism um, a set of postural and gestural um, grammar was established and then propagated throughout the Roman Empire is, is quite unknown. So, but it, it exists. And the fact is the artist was able to draw on that tradition um, in order to create the fresco cycle. So we're not looking at a Renaissance artwork in terms of expressiveness and artistic um, innovation. We're looking at an expression of art that is naturalistic in a Renaissance-like way, but in effect constitutes its own language with a distinctive gestural and postural grammar. And our task then, or our challenge, is to learn the rudiments of that language and read off what it is that the, um, the artist wanted to convey. And what I didn't know that I learned in this book is that there was established a Dionysian uh, artisans and, and, and workshops. And, and so that the, the idea that these motifs have been that are found in Algiers, are, are found in Campania several centuries later in uh, the exact same sort of configuration of Dionysus and Ariadne and, and whatever it happens to be, um, shows that we're dealing with a, a group of initiates who are in that, it doesn't have a cult center, but it has a, a decentralized language. So we, there's no evidence for this, but we may surmise that someone associated with, you know, the, the mystery group at the Villa of the Mysteries knew who to send for, who was also in some way related to or under the auspices of Dionysus to be the painter to do this. And that painter or painters, looks like it's one painter to me, um, came in and, and knew the language of what a, a Dionysian cult center would need. And I find that fascinating. That's, again, not something that's not just a wedding. You know, that's, <laughs> there's, a, mm. there's a decentralized language of a cult across centuries there. Yes, absolutely correct. The, I think the other factor that we have to take account of is the sacrality, the, the sacred nature of this artwork. Um, in other words, you would need an initiate with a very high order, not only of artistic skill, but of understanding to come and perform this artwork. Um, there was a group of uh, Dionysian artists in um, Naples in the first century BCE, and, and that would be within a, a short distance of Pompeii. So I, I'm convinced that the elite, um, given that they were going to spend an enormous amount of money on art, the materials um, for this project, would have been in touch with the um, Dionysian Artists Association in Naples. They would have brought artists out uh, who were also initiates and would be capable because the artwork does not just con um, convey a ritual sequence. It conveys a metaphysics, or specifically the metaphysics of Orphism, and that's done in a very subtle way. So we're really in the presence of a spiritual masterwork here, if we can only read it uh, correctly. Yeah, and we're talking about the presumed painter. Um, whoever that person was, was a really good painter. Like you've, you've actually mentioned uh, the Renaissance a couple of times, but, and that's mm -hmm. deliberately, right? So um, I'm very yeah. interested. I think Gobekli Tepe is a similar version of this. There's something about the Villa of the Mysteries that is a Rosetta Stone, because as you write in the book, the art is recognizably European to the point of honestly looking like some of the stuff I would see on my sort of Renaissance trips in Italy, but it's depicting yeah. something that goes back millennia. So it's this yes. overlap point where we have the visual experience to engage with it and the ideas that we can engage with thanks to the 
the caliber of the sort of um, visuality of it, if you will, um, yeah, means that we can get access to a metaphysics that's much much older than the actual paintings that are there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the whole point about the importance of the vegetation gods is that they spend part of the year underground, so to speak, so that, you know, Dionysus is Hades, actually. And that this provides the central metaphor for um, the mystery process, what it's, uh, what it's attempting to enact and what it is attempting to draw the initiate into is the process of death and rebirth in the most fundamental sense. So that only the vegetation deity really has this natural rhythm to it. Um, and the fact that you can then convert that idea into a set of metaphysical images or symbols is what we see um, evinced in this artwork. So we would need to go through and pick out specifically those elements within the fresco cycle that actually enunciate a metaphysical point of view. Yeah, I think for that, um, people are going to want to actually have, like I had the benefit of, and even though you wrote it, you haven't yet, of actually having, <laughs> having, the, pictures, <laughs> having the pictures in front of them uh, to go through it. But like one of the things that is so modern about the art in like an eerie way, and you write this, and I've been thinking about it since I finished the book, you describe it as possibly the first instance of the female gaze in Western mm. art. And yeah. I can't, I don't, I cannot think of anything. So talk us through that because I think we can, we, this can be an audio discussion, but for the, for the detailed stuff, people are going to want to absorb the images. But talk us through what you mean by that. Mm. Okay, uh, let me just kind of bracket this discussion because th there's like a fork in the road that we, we, we haven't, uh, negotiated yet <laughs> when you look at this room there's two modes in which it could appear one is when it is primed for ritual use it would be lit by flickering torchlight which would animate the figures on the wall okay so that in that light the room serves as what Foucault called a heterotopia it inverts your expectations about a room and about space and is therefore um, supportive of the ritual process. Okay, so we're leaving that aside. Daytime, the room is sufficiently well encoded in its imagery to allow it to serve as what I call a theater of memory. So this is a concept um, which was current. Uh, in the first century, uh, and it, it's using a room as a way of recovering or storing and then recovering information. So when we compare the frescoes in the Villa of the Mysteries with, say, those in the mosaic in Algeria, the Algerian mosaic is far more explicit. It depicts a lot more than we see depicted in the Villa of the Mysteries. So there's a very elusive quality to the villa's imagery. In other words, it, it simultaneously sets out to preserve a ritual and a metaphysics while occluding aspects of both of those two things. Um, if we deal with the female gaze, let's come back to that. There are three figures in the room that actually look at you as you observe the frescoes. In fact, the, the frescoes are structured around three chronotopes, that's to say combinations of space-time. One is the chronological forward-moving time of ritual. The second one is the ever-recurring time of uh, mythical activity. I think you would call it the dream time. And the third one is the present time and space of the observer standing in the room and looking at the frescoes and having the fresco look straight back at you, catch your eye, so to speak. And the first figure to do that is the initiate herself. And she offers in an open hand towards you uh, a green, a sprig of green myrtle. In other words, she's offering an invitation to partake in the mysteries. And this is extraordinarily um, open gesture. Um, 
she is mirrored on the other side of the room by a woman who's having her hair done, a seated woman. And the style of arrangement of her hair is such that we know it's called the senicrines. Seni, seni That's to say the ritual hair styling of a priestess. So she is obviously post-initiation at that stage. She is uh, being proffered a mirror to look in. And she is looking instead straight out into the room uh, to catch the eye of the observer. And the symbolic language here is clear because the mirror within the Dionysian context is the mirror of Dionysus. That's to say, you look into the mirror as a spirit and are then uh, enraptured by reflections. And, and this becomes a metaphor for the drawdown of a spirit into incarnation. So the fact that she is not looking at her own reflection at the end of the initiation sequence means that she has withdrawn her attention from externalities. She is now centered in, in another place spiritually. So both of these women are offering a kind of Orphic message in a direct female gaze, which is, is quite unique in art. I can't think of another instance of such a metaphysically charged um, exchange with the observer. Yeah. And the final one, so uh, not, the, not at the beginning with the woman holding out the myrtle, and it's not just her eyes, as you say, like the way it's painting, the way it's painted, it's like her hand is, is, is holding it out. So you, you get that. But on the other side, the, the woman who's getting her hair done, who's staring back at you, mm. it's almost eerie. Um, it's, it's actually very good. It's, it's quite impressive art to be sort of 2,000 years later and, and to have that kind of uh, to impress upon you so, uh, to affect you so much, I think is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, the, this in itself, that is evidence of a very strongly grounded uh, metaphysics. You know, these people have a very clear conception, a spiritual conception of what it is they want to say and what they stand for. And that comes across if you only read the uh, frescoes in their own language, in their own medium. So you mentioned Orphism a couple of times, and in the book, it's something like Orphism is a metaphysical overlay on traditional Dionysian rites, right? So yep. I guess my question is, is Orphism even a coherent thing? Because on the one hand, you have this sort of god of music who brings the, an ecstatic god to Greece. Um, who mm. get, And on the other hand, you have this very dualist, anti-fun, bodies of prison and punishment, blah, blah, blah. And I've just, I've never quite, I, I get Dionysus. <laughs> Right, but I've never quite got how it sat with orphism, which is quite hall monetary if you do it wrong. You know, it's um, it's a lot of abnegation. I wrote walk. <laughs> well, yeah, I, like it's, uh, anyway. Talk with like is orphism even? A, it, many of these things aren't right. Um, Gnosticism isn't. The mysteries aren't. Uh, orphism is sort of one of those mostly useful umbrellas. But I, I just yeah. find it a bit like unbalanced, right? Because it, anyway, answer that because, we'll, and then we'll talk about other stuff. Okay. Uh, my problem with Orphism is that most of it is filtered through Plato. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was not, so to speak, Plato's original ideas. He always says, as the Orphic poets say. In other words, he's, he always removed, puts himself at one remove from it. But Looking across half a dozen or so different um, Platonic dialogues, it's quite clear that there's at least five key principles which I think Plato at least uh, perceived as core to Orphism. So if I could just enumerate those, it may be useful. Um, the first is the eternal life of the soul. It is kind of fundamental. And we find that in Plato's Phaedo. I can give you the verses, if you like, 69 to 84. Um, and from that, you get a concomitant idea of metapsychosis. Uh, again, it's, uh, Plato's Meno, 81 AB. Um, and from that idea of the eternal life of the soul and its metapsychosis through a number of lives arises the notion of the spiritual justice being meted out, so to speak. And you find that in Laws 870, uh, Cratillus 399 to 400. Um, 
The fourth element is the spiritual equality of all sentient life forms. And, and you've mentioned the goat staring out at us uh, from the frescoes. Um, I think that enunciates that particular point very well. Clearly, the goat is the deity as well, because it's in a kind of rural idyll, and uh, Dionysus was hidden in the form of a goat from Hera um, in that context. So, again, the spiritual quality, the fact that a deity could be looking out at you from an animal form. And that you'd have, to know, you'd have to know the story behind it. This comes back to the theater yeah. and everything. It's not yeah, just... This, this yeah, this again is the elusiveness of the frescoes. You, you do need to know the fundamental myth cycle in which Dionysus is involved to read it. You know, it's part of that language. Um, and finally, you know, the salvic power of purifications and initiations, or telete as they were known. In, it's enunciated in Plato, Plato's Phaedrus 69c. So you put those five principles together, you have a kind of generic Orphism, um, albeit from a Platonic perspective. But I kind of trust him to have got that right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I guess if I look askance at point five, I can, I, I'm, sort of, I'm, I'm sort of on board going, yes, 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 to point five. It's just point five is where you sneak in all that body is a prison crap, but you don't have to. You can also sneak in getting fucked up on mushrooms. So... You know, <laughs> <laughs> lost me there, Gordon. <laughs> well, because if it's like the, the the power of cleansing and initiation, if I leave the because cl cleansing, it's, it's actually metaphysically important. But um, I'm trying to find out whether so much orphism seems so watered down. And you're right; I think we can blame Plato for some of that, to be honest, because it just doesn't. It's so curious to have it. To, ha to have something that has so many frequent kind of anti-fun body is a prison and life on earth is a punishment statements over an ecstatic nocturnal drug taking cult. I've never got that. I've never got how that. Yeah, could be I see your point. Yeah. I think the problem is that the ecstatic maynadism, you know, this wild um, terrier part of animals and eating them raw is purely a function of Euripides Bacche, you know, a prize-winning <laughs> um, play written and performed at the uh, city Dionysia in 407 BC. Aside from that play, there is no other single reference to this behavior <laughs> in the entire corpus of Dionysian-themed art. <laughs> So it has become, I think, you know, through writers, uh, including people like Nietzsche, um, a kind of literary theme um, or trope that this, while maynadism needs to be positioned in relation to the social and cultural life of people. But actually, this is a purely literary theme. Um, there's no evidence for while maynadism whatsoever. Uh, in the cult itself. Sure. Um, However, okay. if, if we go to the paintings in, in room five, we have a, a, a woman who looks like she's had way too much ketamine about to be, and it's like half nude leaning over someone in, in their lap okay. about to be whipped with mania. And yeah, so yeah. like there are drugs, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think there's in order to, um, successfully conduct an initiate, initiatory tradition of this intensity without a fixed um, kind of temple-like structure, you know, with a priesthood like Eleusis or Samothrace. This is, this is done on an itinerant basis. It's almost like the initiator comes in. Um, as long as the people have prepared themselves properly, they, they just do the initiation. So. It has far more props to the initiatory process than, for instance, um, the typical higher initiation conducted today. And I'm thinking specifically of the higher yoga tantra in the Indo-Tibetan realm. People show up and they get the initiation and it works. They don't need drugs. Okay? But in this itinerant temporary space, um, tradition, there's the need to bolster the, the ritual process 
as much as possible. So there's two aspects to the drug. One is that uh, I believe it was uh, a musc muscimol, which is a, a stimulant, um, and I believe that it was administered rectally so that both of these things are known to cause Kundalini uh, activation. And when they're both brought together in a very intense ritual process by somebody who has the initiatory lineage, the four elements work to ensure that the uh, process works. That, that's my take on it, Gordon. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's one of the things I thought was interesting is you see, it looks like uh, Amanita muscaria mushrooms in the actual paintings, right? So it, it, whether I, I found that I found it fascinating the idea of using um, essentially lubing up um, a dildo with with some sort of self. I think there's there's a lot to to recommend that. But I also because I I think a lot about uh, entheogens and and sort of the ancient worlds intoxicants and they are they were so good because we uh, you actually mentioned this in the book we don't really it's less commonly known than it probably should be that no one drank um full wine it was disgusting and and it wasn't how it was but it was watered down and mixed with herbs and so on and there's this yeah. entire language of steeping things in wine that i've had when I was in different legal regimes where more of these things were available to me, I've experimented with that myself and you get the most unbelievable effects. And, and I think intoxicants were a cornerstone of it. And I just sort of think of the last time I was on LSD at the end of last year, a high dose anyway. And I went walking through the, uh, there are these lanes in Melbourne that have all this amazing um, mm -hmm. graffiti and so on. And you yeah. think if you are in some sense altered and you're there in the, the torch, little torchlight in the dark and these figures are moving and you're dancing and other people are wearing masks and dancing probably. And um, you would be, you would come out of that experience changed. And this is the, the argument for entheogens in places like Eleusis that you essentially have one or two nights and, and it has, as far as we can tell, a hundred percent success rate. Like no one, it's not like we 60% promise you will see God and lose all fear of death. Mm. It's if you come and do this and it's, as you say, like, in an itinerant sense, like the person has to show up with the intoxicants because they essentially have a one night only show <laughs> yeah. to get this yeah. done. And I think people, there's been a historic academic squeamishness emerging out of the 19th century, which is hilarious because the Romans were high and drunk all the time. Like yeah, opium was used for everything. Like, mm. um, and, and I just, I find it really fascinating that you can, this is another kind of, it's a pretty messed up wedding. If people are that, off their face and there's yeah. a goat staring at you and like a naked kid reading something and whatever like this isn't a normal wedding and uh, but the, it, it's just a testament to how good the art is that th here is a woman who is in the throes of mania and that's clearly depicted <laughs> yeah on the walls yeah um I, I think the other factor the fifth factor in in ensuring this process would run correctly is, is the preparations so that ideologically um, the initiate coming into this process was probably been preparing themselves for, for months in terms of ritual washing, purification, preparation of items, uh, devotions to the deity. You, you need to take account of an entire ritually and uh, spiritually prime mindset coming into this process so that you know already there's a, a number of of avenues potential avenues that the mind could wander off on um which we do associate with with uh, things like lsd they, they've been narrowed down to a very um very narrow sphere of encountering the deity in a very in the most sacred way so with that predisposition, with the disorientation of the room, and then the other items, the presence of the uh, initiator who has that energy. And one of the things I'd like to mention in this context is I was able to establish the most likely uh, cult titles of the initiator, the Greek woman at the beginning of the fresco cycle. One would be Nymphae, which would be a bride typical of any um, 
initiate to uh, the higher rites of initiation. And the other was Dracaena or dragon. In other words, it's, it's somebody who embodies the Kundalini energy in such an intense form that it is, um, it draws in people in the immediate vicinity. And, and this, is a, this is a very real experience as well. Sure. So that, you know, the chance that when you add all of these elements together, you're going to have a very directed, uh, very focused outcome. And I, I, I think it's because of that that they could deliver this experience of the divine rather than simply, you know, falling over <laughs> on the floor or, or whatever. Well, it's it's a thousand years of technology. Like yeah. they've, they've got good at the combination of these things. I did a a, a, a month long, or oh, not quite month long. I did a multi week dieta in the jungle in Peru um, this mm. year, and it's the stuff you have to give up beforehand, and then when you're yes. there, and and whatever. So I, I get all that absolutely. And by the end of it, I was fully aware that every step of it. Um, I understood completely the logic of the full dieta, why you can't eat these things and why you shouldn't have them. And it was really, really fascinating to experience that because mm. there are a couple of places in the world that are accessible to us that aren't like the Eleusinian mysteries, but also kind of are in the, um, in the macro structure sense of purification, going somewhere for sacred purposes away from the world and then yeah. returning. Right. So um, yeah. absolutely. I get that logic, but you mentioned the initiator, uh, one, the only person that we kind of know is a real person who's in the room is essentially the the mistress of the house, the mistress of the the villa. Um, do you think just there's no? This is just your personal opinion, right? Like, do you yeah. think she is in fact the um, the initiator, or do you think the initiator was a, herself a real person who maybe lived in this enormous house at the same time as the family? What do you What do you think? Do you think the the woman you know, of the household was like the witch queen of this cult? Yeah, you, you think of the uh, woman called the Domino who sits yes. at the, the very back. Uh, I, she is a standard figure of Dionysian <laughs> initiation. She, you know, the same figure occurs in Algeria, in Jamela, oh, right. I in the mosaics. Right. It's identical. Um, what that figure does in the fresco cycle is she's sitting on, on a couch, okay? But... She's only sitting on half the couch. The other half disappears into the wall. And I think what she represents is the metaphysical unity that the post-initiate has with the deity. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how I read that. No, oh, cool. cool. Her other was... half is, is like through the wall. It's in another dimension. Yeah, so yeah, speak. yeah. Yeah, I like it. I was under the impression that she was depicted elsewhere in the villa, not elsewhere in the kind of like macro Dionysian world. Um, no, she she's part of the uh, style book of. Uh, uh, well, that's cool. I'm also slightly disappointed because as I was putting the questions together, I'm like, I wonder if there's this like because that's a that's an HBO show waiting to happen. This like extremely wealthy, highborn woman who's also the head of this well, Dionysian cult. One one of the doubts i had in my mind is that while the postural and gestural repertoire is easily um traceable to other places the faces of the women look like they are real people and my guess is that this rich <laughs> family spent so much money on this testament to their dionysian um Piasos or organization, they had themselves placed into the fresco cycle. Now, there's no way on earth to prove this, Gordon, but those faces are the faces of real people. Yeah, but that's a fair statement. I think that's might have been where my confusion is because if you look elsewhere in Pompeii, you do have that kind of like Portrait these are th these are humans. This is what <laughs> yeah. this what a human who wants to live looks like. Okay, yeah. good. So I can still hold out hope that there'll be an American horror story or similar series that's set in the Villa of the Mysteries. That would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, Peter, congratulations uh, on the book. It is. Um, Trust me, when you see it, you'll be very impressed with yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but on that note, uh, I mean, you're about to leave to head to London. Uh, actually, yeah. by the time this comes out, you'll be in London. And yeah. there will, for people who are listening to it, 
they might even be able to come to the launch, which is on Saturday. Tell us about that. Tell us what you got, you know, coming up as a result of the book uh, in the UK, that kind of thing. The launch, I'm going to project images from the fresco cycle uh, in Treadwells and talk people through the initiatory process whilst looking at the fresco itself. That, that, that's what the launch is about. Are there tickets uh, still available as of the time of recording? There's no tickets. You, you just show up, give your name, put your name on a list and show up. It's free. And is that all day or are you doing that in the evening? No, it's going to be uh, between 7 and 10, something like that. I'll talk as long as people can tolerate it. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll have some wine and I'll sign anyone's books who wants the book sign or answer questions. Or so it's 7 p.m. <laughs> 7 p.m. at Treadwells. At Treadwells, Saturday. yeah. Free. And what else, yeah, and for the premium members in the UK, what else are you doing? Oh, um, I'm hoping to join up with them in Liverpool on the following Saturday um, at the coffee shop in Liverpool World Museum Excellent. at 2 o'clock. Nice. And, and anyone who wants to show up is, is most welcome. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, just sit down, have some good coffee and chat. <laughs> Indeed. And um, elsewhere online, what else you got coming up? What, you know, this is the bit Not laid much. on people. I've got the, um, I put my website up now after, you know, we're still building that, but that that's up, petermarkadams.com. Um uh, apart from that, not much else really. I'm I'm still in recovery from having <laughs> written the book. Yeah, <laughs> and understood. thinking about the next projects to undertake. So, all right. Well, of course, links to links to where people can get the book and to your website and all that information um, will be in the show notes if you're listening. And uh, yeah, Peter, once again, congratulations and uh, and thanks very much for your time. I thank you, Gordon. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. There you have it. One thing to mention right off the bat is in between recording and then editing this episode, Peter and I discovered that while the launch event at Treadwells definitely is free, places are strictly limited and you will want to register beforehand so you can actually get in. The link to do so is in the show notes. Uh, otherwise, go to scarletimprint.com as are links to where you can find more about the book and all that good stuff. So check out the show notes. Anyway, that's this week's episode. Not for the first time do I wish I was back in London this weekend, but we make our own fun down here in the Upside Down too. For instance, if any of you are interested in a retro suburbia workshop or even becoming a retro suburbia trainer, that's the next event I'm organizing for Permaculture Tasmania in Hobart next month. Details on the Permaculture Tasmania website. Speaking of websites, this show has one. It's called Rune Soup. Be sure to check it out too. Subscribe to the newsletters, become a member, etc. But yeah, that's it. Feels good to be back on a weekly schedule again. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>